Okay, good evening, everybody. I am Chloe Waddington. I'm the partner and director of Timothy Taylor New York. It is my pleasure this evening to introduce you to Molly Mornock, art historian and curator of Unfolding, and David Reed, the very renowned conceptual artist and painter. Uh, unfortunately, Sarah Crowner could not join us this evening. She does send her regrets. Uh, but I will leave it to Molly and David to talk to you all about Amtai's lasting legacy and his impact on the landscape of contemporary art. I hope you enjoy. Thank you, Chloe, for that introduction. Thanks to all of you for being present this evening. I wanted to begin by thanking Timothy Taylor and the entire gallery staff for creating this opportunity. And I wanted to say in particular that when Tim first approached me about the possibility of doing this show, one of the things that really appealed to me was his conviction that Antai is absolutely a painter for the present and that his work speaks to problems in contemporary painting. And the idea of using this exhibition in part as a forum to explore his relevance for today was immensely attractive. I also thought that it might be worth saying a few words, both uh, on my part, and I would like David to say a few words too, about how we came to be engaged with Antai's work in the first place. For me, the really key event, as I've written elsewhere, was the 2001 exhibition called As Painting, Division and Displacement, which took place at the Wexner Center for the Arts. That is to say, an exhibition in Columbus, Ohio, that did not travel, right? This was a very important exhibition that was one of the first in the United States to show in some time the work of a number of French painters who maybe had had some earlier visibility, but then had been largely eclipsed. So Simon Antai, James Bishop, uh, Claude Viola, for example, a number of painters associated with Supor Surface, some of the less well-known letters of Vm Pete, so for example, Michel Parmentier, alongside Daniel Buren. Now, this show has become quasi-legendary, I would say, yes, in retrospect, yes. yeah, in yeah. part on the strength of its extremely compelling catalog. But I think it's interesting to recall that in 2001, again, didn't travel, was barely reviewed when you go back to try to find critical traces of this show. And that really tells you something about um, the lack of visibility that a number of these practices had had up to that point. Now, one of the things that was innovative about that exhibition was that it was showing the work of these French painters in the context of, to speak very roughly, let's say sort of American practices since post-minimalism. So Antai alongside Robert Smithson, Donald Judd, Eva Hesse, for example. Um, and it really helped, I think, to sort of take these painters out of their isolation and think about them within a larger transatlantic field. Now, I happened to be present for that show because I had had the good fortune of studying as an undergraduate with Stephen Melville, who was one of the three curators of that exhibition. I was already doing a PhD elsewhere, but I came back to see the show that Stephen had been working on, and this turned out to be one of the decisive encounters of my life. It set me on a path that took me to France, eventually to Antai's studio, where I met with him regularly over a period of years, looked at a lot of work in the studio, um, and then it was off to the races. And I'm happy to talk about this in part, because working on Antai has also brought me to a number of other artists, including David. In 2010, I was asked to curate Antai's first exhibition in New York in some years at the Paul Kasman Gallery. And at the end of that exhibition, I noticed that David Reed had signed the guest book many, many, many times. <laughs> <laughs> and I was intrigued by this and wondered what exactly had brought him back to the show so many times. When 10 years later, time passing as it does, uh, Elodie Rard and I started working on the first volume of Transatlantique, inviting contemporary painters to write about Simon Antai. Um, this came immediately to mind, and I think David's was the first name that I proposed because I wanted to hear something about what he had made of that show and what else he might 
know about Simon Antai. David, I don't know if you would like to say a little bit about your, I'd how you came to, to Antai. And also I should say I missed the show in Columbus. I had meant to go to uh, Stephen Melville's show, but um, it was a long way to go, yeah. and I kept hoping it would travel, and it never did. So you're right, it was a big missed opportunity. Because um, all of us here in New York would have been profited by seeing that show and being more aware of the French painters earlier. Yeah. Um, so I did sign the guest book that <laughs> often in the Paul Kasman show because I became fascinated by two paintings especially in that show. There were two of kind of of this type. Is yeah, that early right? paintings. And Han Tai had buried the paintings for a period and then dug them out. Oh, am I exaggerating? He hadn't literally buried them, but they had been, let's <laughs> they say. They looked like they'd been buried. They looked somewhat <laughs> like. They had a very sedimentary quality, let's say. Yeah, and I love the idea of a kind of resurrected painting yeah. and what that might mean. Yeah. Um, so okay. I went back often to see those paintings and the rest of the show. Yeah. Because I didn't know much about Han Tai. I'd seen a few pieces here and there. And I'd read some things, but um, I didn't know a lot. I don't think any of us here in America knew enough about Han Tai at that point. The Marielle in particular that I think really struck you at Paul Kasman's was MC8 from 1962. And this moves me quite a bit because this is also one of the paintings that I saw at the Wexner Center. So we were wow. both in some ways brought to Antai wow by the early work in particular. There were other paintings by Antai, but I remember that that was the one that I stood in front of just trying, trying to understand. You've written very beautifully about the ways in which that painting seemed to you to open up readings of the art of Jackson Pollock that were new to you. Yes, yes. I wonder, seeing the two Marial that we have been fortunate enough to include in this exhibition, um, MC8 right here and MA7, which is in the back room from uh, 1962 and 1960, respectively. Do you feel that that is, is that feeling about the Mary Alice confirmed or perhaps expanded? Yes, I feel that more and more that um, one of the problems on both sides of the Atlantic is how to get beyond Pollock. And, um, Antai found a way that was very clear, and I wish we'd seen it here in America earlier and seen his work in that light. Um, I feel there's been many oppor missed opportunities mm -hmm. between American and French painting. I went to the studio school, and my teachers there were very Pr proud of American painting mm -hmm. and didn't want to talk about French painting. There's a bias here and mm -hmm. a pride about New York painting mm -hmm. that got in the way of seeing work from other countries. So I think it was a missed opportunity. I think I would have understood Pollock better if I had known about Han Tai's work. Could you say more about what you think Han Tai might have helped to illuminate in Pollock himself? Well, that it was um, inventing a new method yeah. and, uh, of painting. Yeah. And I, as a young artist, I hadn't thought about it that way. Um, at the time, for a while, people thought some of the other artists, like um, Newman, invented more of a new method, mm -hmm. and that with Pollock, it was just a technique, and that wouldn't lead very far. But I think Han Tai saw that it was a method of painting, mm -hmm. and a, a, an invention of a method of painting. 
And I wish I thought at a young age of um, trying to do that myself with painting. Instead, I just didn't think in those terms. I'm very happy that you use this phrase, inventing a method or inventing a medium. I sort of go back and forth among this language in the curatorial statement that I wrote for this exhibition. Antai does, of course, famously prevent, present pliage as a method, as a specific set of procedures to produce paintings. And that is a term that I think has a lot built into it. It has something to do with technique, the idea of, as I think Antai would put it, fundamentally changing the technology of painting, how we get paint on a surface, how the surface is itself handled, uh, how it is approached in its materiality, for which he found a kind of precedent in Pollock and also in Henri Matisse and certain other figures yes. who were important to him. Method also has built into it the idea of a certain kind of repeatability, but a repeatability that will produce differences. And so one of the things that I think emerges when we have the opportunity to see, as with the Marielle, different instances of the same painting group is how actively the pictorial configuration is in fact changing over time. It is a method, but it's not a kind of rigid procedure that he's simply applying, right? There is a tremendous amount of painterly decision making that's going on in front of every canvas, and we're getting extremely varied visual results. Yes, I'm impressed with the variety that he could take these initial ideas into so that all the paintings are so unique and different. It's, it's very impressive. Did you think when you were making, for example, early works such as the brushstroke paintings in 74, 75, did you think that you were trying to invent a new kind of painting method? At the time, I didn't think about that. I was going on instinct about things that I wanted to try and experiment with. And I wished I, now looking back, that I thought about it more in those terms. Because I think you could look about at those paintings about trying to achieve a certain immediacy of the mm -hmm. gesture. Mm -hmm. and and the ways I could take that and seeing it both from inside the painting and from outside at mm -hmm. the same time as I was making the marks so that I was aware of the whole painting and also aware of each mark. Yeah. But I, I wished I had a, a broader view at the time but it always is that way for painting. You try things and they lead you certain ways. Yeah. And that's what happened to me. Yeah, yeah. This idea that you were just speaking about with the brushstroke paintings, trying to have a very sort of immediate relationship to yes. the painting, to be in the process, to be immersed in the process. This, I think, is a very interesting aspiration. It's an aspiration that is, um, goes quite deeply in Antai's own practice. So for example, um, the earliest painting that we have included in the show is this untitled work from 1958, right at the entry, the black painting with the gesture subtracted for, from it. And one of the things that I talk about a little bit in my statement is how this fits in to a certain moment in Antai's practice when his desire to be fully immersed in a certain blind practice of painting is breaking down, and that's starting to be a certain problem. It's worth mentioning that Antai is painting in response to a certain understanding of Jackson Pollock in Paris that is really stressing the action of painting. Rosenberg is read very actively in France long before Greenberg is going to be actively received. So you have a discourse that is very much about being in the experience of painting. And of course, some of the painters that Antai really admires say things that go in this direction too. So for example, Jackson Pollock's very famous statement that when he is painting, he is, when he is in the painting, he doesn't know what he's about, right? Antai is very attracted to this idea of working blindly 
also a version of the old surrealist idea that you somehow outrace your conscious intentions and produce something you could not possibly have foreseen. But the problem, I think, is that he's discovering what you discover later, which is that you're always sort of inside and outside yeah. that process. You're yeah. in the process and you're observing your yeah. process. Yeah. And no matter how quickly you paint, you still have a kind of consciousness of what you're yeah. about. Yeah. I, I thought I was um, self-conscious and yeah. couldn't continue to be in the painting. I kept having a split consciousness, both outside observing what I was doing as well as being inside the painting. Yeah. And at times I thought it was because I was late in the tradition so that I was just being self-conscious. And some of that may be true, mm -hmm. but I think there's this split consciousness is almost always there in some mm -hmm. way. And you can try and deny it, but it is there and you can't really. Yeah. I've always thought of Pliage as Antai's answer to this problem, right? Wow. When I started working on Antai, I was very struck by a kind of constant tropism in the literature that was really stressing pliage as a way of completely setting aside the self and you know painting and without any sort of intention and outside subjectivity and all of this. And I thought, no, that's what Antai wants at an earlier moment. Pliage is actually the acknowledgement that it is impossible to fully set aside the self. And the point of pliage is that there's no fiction of working so incredibly quickly that you're outracing your conscious mind. A lot of the paintings that we're looking at in this room would have taken months for him to make, right? What he's after with folding is something different. It's something that creates a kind of procedural blindness but allows him also to be attending to the work throughout its making and throughout its, in some cases, unfolding, refolding, repainting, refolding, refolding. And so I think that's one of the things that it's important to show and to see now. And, and also, I think it just occurred to me, Molly, his hands must have known a lot of what to do mm -hmm. before his mind did. So you could let his hands take off and do the folding, and they would make results that would surprise yeah. him visually yeah. that he hadn't pre-planned. Yeah. I think that's a very important aspect of it. And in fact, I mean, the, the prospect that making of these paintings could also have been kind of boring, <laughs> right? So one of the examples that I would go to would be the 1972 painting here with the blue knots, which would have involved an incredible repetition of fairly banal routine gestures. So he's pulling up those pouches of canvas. He's making them into this sort of tight, compacted, bud-like form. He's tying that off. He's applying the paint. It's one coat of the blue paint, and then you have to let it dry. There's no fiction that he stands outside himself, that these are you know, unconscious, fully spontaneous gestures. And I think that combination of quasi-automatic gesturality and yet unforeseeability is what makes Pliage such a remarkable resource yes. for him. Yes, I can see that. And the variability and the possibilities. I mean, the one by the door, yeah. if you come in, you can see he used the pliage and then painted into it afterwards yeah. to change how it worked. Yeah. And I thought that was remarkable to see that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that we see when we're able to see the early work in particular is the density of the decision making in part because so many of those paintings are multiply folded and repainted. And so you can see him, you know, standing in front of the unfolded result and saying, you know what, I'm gonna go back in. Yeah. yeah. And then maybe I'm going back in a third time, right? The density of his intentionality in these objects, I think is what really remains to be thought through. And this is really an uphill battle. I mean, the discourse around the asubjective nature of pliage today as much as it was in the 1970s. Wow. And in, here in New York with abstract expressionism, it all seemed to be about it being subjective, yeah. which I don't think it was. It was more complicated than that. So 
it seems people can't imagine the two things happening at once, which is, I think, what painting is good at doing. Yeah. One thing I wanted to ask you about a little bit, since you've talked about a sort of loss of historical possibility and you have sort of referred to what might have been possible had French and US painters had a bit more contact, a bit more information. I was interested in asking you about the orange painting here in the corner, the 1968 Main. You arrive at the New York Studio School in 1966. Antai is on the cusp of this breakthrough series, which is, of course, the first in which the non-painted canvas becomes as important as the painted forms. And he sees that the non-painted space can paint, as he so famously puts it. I wonder what would a painting like this have looked like in New York in 1968? Can you imagine that having had a certain visibility? What would have been the frameworks for it? What might have followed from it? I think you asked me this a little earlier today. <laughs> it's hard for me to imagine. Um, it would have looked very strange, very different than what was going on here. I think I could have made some connections through Matisse mm -hmm. um, and interpreted it that way, but I'm not sure if I would have been sophisticated enough then to do it. Um, it's interesting that traditions of painting, once you lose touch with the tradition, and don't see someone's work develop, mm -hmm. it's hard to suddenly step into it and yeah. see it more. I think we talked about that ha <coughs> happening with Han Tai, because the earlier work, like this painting, wasn't seen here. It was harder for people to understand the later paintings. Yeah. And I think that uh, would have happened even more in earlier times. In 68, um, of course, in this thought experiment, we would have just had the yes. Jackson Pollock retrospective at MoMA. Yes. There might have been some new openings there. It's, it's possible. Um, I mean, people had a hard time with the late Pollocks yeah. at that time, too. And yeah. he had been classified as doing one kind of work. So the, this painting would probably would be best seen in relation to some of the later Pollocks. People wouldn't have wanted to see it that way, I think. Mm. I'm not sure. Are you thinking of the Pollocks in which we start to get some more imagery coming back through? Yes, yes. I think those were very strange to people and um, and for me, they were some of the favorites. And I mean, I love the Duco paintings. Mm -hmm. These are the paintings that were um, like mythical figures, figurative elements. And they were painted with um, black Duco on raw canvas. And when you first saw those paintings, they had a beautiful lavender light that came from the paint, the duco, soaking into the oil. So you would have cold black, mm -hmm. a halo of oil around it, very warm, and then cold white outside. So value difference and hue, and not hue, but um, temperature difference. Mm -hmm. And it made the same lavender light that's in this painting. Mm -hmm. And I love those paintings for that. And, I, and they set up a certain kind of space, a buzz that you can see in this painting in which those figures could exist. And then I watched those paintings age over the next 20 years until you could no longer see that lavender light. It was just a dead, dark brown against a brown canvas. Usually 
the stores had removed the oil stain. So there was none of the optical buzz that had happened earlier in the painting. And um, it, it was a lesson for what to avoid if there is mm -hmm. possibly a way. Mm -hmm. um, I love this phrase that you just used, the optical buzz. <laughs> That's a very way, a very good way, I think, of describing another major topic in Antai's painting and his thinking about painting. It's the entire problematic that he referred to sometimes as phenomenal color or called color, which is to say, color that is not literally applied to the canvas, that can't be localized within the object, but that results for us optically when we behold certain colors and certain configurations under particular lighting circumstances. This is something that Antai notices for the first time in 1958-59 with a major painting now at the Centre Pompidou called um, the rose colored writing work would be yes. probably the best way of translating this into English. And it's a painting that famously has no pink ink on the surface, but produces this kind of rosy glow when beheld in the light. It's not something he can actualize really in 58, 59. But after the main and after he starts becoming very interested in these large white spaces that are breaking up the painted form and re-articulating the surfaces upon unfolding, he starts noticing that when you have more non-painted space, you start getting these very interesting optical effects. And it's something that he particularly explores um, systematically with the tabula the very late large tabulas of which we have such a beautiful example here and one that I think you've referred to it as a kind of lavender light. I see a kind of rosy glow, yes. but certainly a kind of color effect that is not in the painting, but as it were in our eyes. Yes. This is something that you've been particularly interested yes, in. Yes, I am. I had seen this light in the Pollux and I missed it. I was so sad that it was gone from those paintings, and I knew how important it was to the paintings. And then I had an experience in my studio. I was, stand, I was sanding, um, believe it or not, lead canvases out on the fire escape to keep the lead dust inside and let it fall over Broadway. <laughs> <laughs> And I was doing it in the bright sun, so I was looking at these canvases and sanding. And when I came back into my studio, suddenly the light coming in through the window and the electric lights were a beautiful rose color, you know, as beautiful as that Hantai painting. And I just love it. It was a very magical color, and it was an experience that meant a lot to me. I tried to make paintings about it, to paint that color and understand what had happened. I think your optical new, um, nerves get overcome at a certain point, so you see different color when you look at light. Um, and I wanted to follow that light and see what it meant. Um, and I'm very impressed that Han Tai was also interested in it. And I knew about that light from the Pollock paintings, mm -hmm. which is where I think Han Tai may have first seen it. So I kept looking for this light yeah. and I could find it other places as well, finally. Antai saw this in Matisse's chapel in Vence. Yes. And in particular, you know, not, not just the light that's coming through the stained glass windows, but in particular, you know, the confessional door oh. has that very complicated sort of cut out um, white screen, as it were. And at a certain time of day, Antai felt that the light coming through that took on this sort of rose lilac wow. glow. Wow. I've heard about these things. I haven't been there to see this Matisse chapel. And, but I know he must have been trying to make colored light to go with the black and white. Mm 
Mm -hmm. And the color seems to me to come not as an, a, um, a red to green kind of a thing, mm -hmm. but rather from warm to cool mm -hmm. and from at air, edges of value contrast. Mm -hmm. So it would make sense that that be the case. I would love to see this. And at first I had thought that Matisse must have intended the colored light to come from the stained glass window. But then I finally realized, no, that wasn't it. That it was gonna be an optical light, like yeah. the light that so interests me. Yeah. I think the other place I had seen this is in Tintoretto paintings in Venice at the Academia. And he does very striking things with creating rose light that isn't there. Mm -hmm. um, and I, he does it because he uses um, dyes. He was the first painter to make pigments out of dyes. And the... Okay. Okay, excuse me. So, Tintoretto, his family made dye, dyes. And he was the first painter, I think, and certainly the first of Venetian painting to add to use dyes to make pigments. Mm -hmm. And um, doing that, he could make colors that couldn't be made other ways and could make kinds of optical light. Mm -hmm. And these same dyes are now what we use in photography and for clothing. It's ubiquitous in the world. And painting, we're using paint now that often have these dyes mm -hmm. in them. So it's a whole evolution of the possibilities for painting through mm -hmm. new different mm -hmm. pigments. Mm -hmm. This idea that optical color has something to do with warm against cool, yes. I think this was something that Antai was also testing, I think, in one of his final groups of paintings that he shows before he withdraws from exhibiting his work for a long period from essentially late 1982 until 1998. He shows a group of white on white tabulas that he calls tabula lila. And the lila, lilac, is in fact a reference to colors that are, again, not physically present on these canvases, but are produced by this group of works, which he shows under a skylight at the Galerie Jean Fournier in Paris. And there it really does have to do with the somewhat cooler white pigment against the warmer white of the canvas that he has not, in this case, primed, which is one reason why these paintings prove yeah. to be yeah. quite ephemeral, because they're essentially burned by the sun in the course of this exhibition and then afterwards, and yellowed, and this light goes away. Yeah, it's, it's such a sad thing that this beautiful kind of color in both Pollock and in those paintings of Han Tai is impermanent. Mm -hmm. And how do you make it permanent? This is a difficult question. I think for Han Tai, it ceases to be the question though. And I yeah. think that there's a way in which Han Tai comes to value color precisely because its effects are so contingent and also so contingent upon decidedly finite human embodied vision, right? That optical color has to do yeah. with the way that our, our eyes are wired to our brain. It's the finite vision of a human being, right? And at a certain point he understands that's a light that he has to let go because paintings do age and the circumstances of their showing change. And that temporal and material finitude itself comes to be a, particular interest to him, I think. Yeah, I admire that about him. I've not been able to reach that kind of objectivity about it. I love that light so much that I hate to see it go. And I've hated to see it disappear from the, um, the, the paintings that I've loved. 
And I admire the painters that have managed to keep it in their paintings and not lose it. Um, I wish I could have that bigger um, point of view about it. And I see what a great thing it does with um, Han Tai's work, that he has all kinds of um, imagery about things that are lost or fragile. Mm -hmm. And there's, so, yeah. And um, yeah, and I love that in his work. I have, and I think it gives him interesting openings. But I think he was also looking for a way to make it more permanent, mm -hmm. and sometimes succeeding better, yeah. and sometimes not. There are a couple interesting moments that I talk about towards the end of my book where at a certain point he's invited to um, do a project at Le Frenois and he has access to digital technology that he had not explored previously. And initially he wants to know if there would be a way of like printing new versions of these tabula lilas where you could sort of doctor them in Photoshop and you could get rid of all of the yellowing that had happened to the canvases and then they would produce that light again. And then at a certain point he realizes that's impossible, right? And so he makes a set of digital prints that in fact um, memorialize the tabula lilas instead. And I think becomes very interested in that idea of you know, what it is to have to definitively abandon something or to be abandoned by one's own practice yeah. because of the way that it has changed. Yeah. yeah I. I would love to see those works in person, and I admire his attitude, and I, it, yeah, but I like the, if it would be, po I, I would like permanence, if, you know, even though um, it may be impossible. Um, it's the way, it, it's something I don't want to give up, <laughs> even though it's a limitation that I feel the way I do. It's just a different way of feeling about your work, perhaps. Yeah, I, I think it is. It's, I, I love these effects that I've seen so much that I would like them to always be there in the painting and to be able to return to them. I think for Antai, some of the recognitions that he has in his experience of color and optical color in particular deepen the kind of recognitions that Pliage is producing for him from the first, yes. which is to say that his agency is limited. He is accepting that limitation. Yeah. His mastery has been abrogated in various ways. And precisely what appeals to him about this called color is that he can do certain things in the hope that he'll make it happen. But because it's not just literally applying that color on a canvas, right? He has to see what happens. Yeah. This, I think, speaks to a very complex model of intentionality. So if I reject the idea that Antai is completely setting aside intentionality, I would want to say that Antai intends to make works that exceed his intentions. And color comes to be a particularly vivid aspect of painting for thinking through that, I think. So much about the contingency of a certain situation, right? How are those paintings going to be lit? What is next to them? It's true, and it's one of the beauties of painting that it's different each time it's seen in different lights. And, um, I, I, I'm not sure why I long so much for this other thing, but I still do. Um, I mean, the Tintoretto paintings do it, and they still do it. Yeah. That um, he paints with white um, lead paint. He has wonderful off greens all around it. It turns a beautiful rose color. It looks like it's rose, but it's not. It's, all, it's optical color. And I saw paintings at the Academia in um, Venice, <coughs> and 
and on a beautiful day with a bright light at the right time of day. And boy, did, were they amazing to see. Um, so it can be done. You know, Antaya has a Mariao dedicated to Tintoretto. Oh, really? <laughs> the dedication is much later than the Marial, but he appends it at the moment that he gives the painting to the Musée de la Ville in Paris. Wow. I wondered if he was aware of these optical effects in Tintoretto, and I'd love to um, find out more about that. He looks hard at Tintoretto when he represents France at the Venice Biennale, which he does oh, in 1982. How interesting. How interesting. Because um, I feel Tintoretto is the source for some of this optical color and um, can do it because of the dye pigments that he's hmm. using. Hmm. And by coincidence, the new pigments we're using now for paint in acrylic especially are the dye pigments and in photography as well, and in the clothes that we wear. Almost everywhere in the world we're seeing these particular kinds of color that I think in some way come out of Tintoretto. <laughs> you know, that's his name. He's the, his family the is Dyer. the Dyers. And um, I think he may have done it because it was cheap, you know. <laughs> and he could get away with it. And, and he had access to pigments that the other painters couldn't find or didn't know how to make or use. So um, he had other reasons as well. Um, it's a remarkable thing, I think. I wonder if we should open the floor to discussion. Oh, we have a question back there. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. So thank you for the discussion. Um, I think uh, just carrying off what you were speaking about, I want to ask about your opinion and experience with color specifically. So you spoke about Tintoretto, and then I was thinking about El Greco, um, maybe uh, Della Robbia, like certain like quote unquote old master artists who I feel like are somewhat timeless because of their use of color. And then, you know, we're looking at um, these paintings and I'm thinking like, you know, this could have been painted yesterday, I feel. Mm -hmm. And I wonder from your experience observing art, your studies, your experience being an artist, if there's something universal about human experience, humanity, human tastes where there's certain colors that feel timeless. They could be a thousand years old, but still feel fresh in you. So I just was wondering if you've ever thought about that experience that have any opinions about that. Yeah, I've, I've studied, I've looked hard at paintings by a, a lot of old master paintings and they're very sophisticated with their color. Like Rubens, for example, it's just unbelievable what he can do with warm and cool, with off greens, and the way he can create color mm -hmm. and make flesh tones that aren't really made with flesh tones mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's a lot to be found. And what I notice is it's often transparency that makes the color possible. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's the, one of the paths I followed try and use the color I want to use is transparency. People think of glazing in old master painting as something very fussy. Mm -hmm. Tintoretto would take a can of paint, throw it on the painting, and as it ran down would mark into it. They're very directly done and done with transparent and opaque paint in ways that makes the paint alive in remarkable ways. And, yeah. 
Do you feel that color is an under-theorized topic in contemporary yes. art? It's very difficult <laughs> to think about, very yes. difficult to, reproduce. to talk about, yes. to reproduce. And because of that, it's very special. Mm -hmm. it, um, I feel this color we see around the world in us now, all around us, is um, changing our perceptions of color and changing who we are because the color is different. And painting has a chance to define what those colors are. And painting is especially good for this because it has traditional meanings for certain colors mm -hmm. or a history mm -hmm. of meanings mm -hmm. that you can fit this, the new perceptions into. Yeah. Antai was in fact very interested in the sort of transition from colors that are historically and even religiously coded. So for example, yes. in this major painting of 1958-59 that I mentioned before, where he first sees this phenomenon of optical, as it were, rose-colored light, um, he's writing on that painting in inks that have to do with the colors of the liturgical calendar. So his palette is, as it were, predetermined, it's coded. And then, you know, each one of those colors has a specific color. I mean, lavender is the color of morning, green is the color of ordinary time, which is an idea I sort of love. And in fact, all of that rose comes from the copious amounts of green ink because it turns out there's a lot of ordinary time in the liturgical calendar. And then later, Antai's colors don't have those historical meanings, not quite in that way. But I mean, for him in some ways, you know, the, the transition to modernity in some sense is moving color beyond these sort of received and regulated codes, trying to reimagine color outside the sort of inherited framework, which for him is primarily a liturgical framework. That's a large topic, though. It is, and I think a very interesting <laughs> one. It really, it all fascinates me. I've just realized, um, Molly, we didn't talk about one of the subjects we wanted to. I wonder, I'm asking my own question. <laughs> I don't think it, that's allowed. But we'll allow we, it. <laughs> I mean, we were talking, trying to think of other painters and um, that did something in relation to what Han Tai did. Yeah. And we thought about Jack Whitten, as well as a number of others. So I've been very fascinated in preparing for our talk to think about the relations between them. Because Jack, being competitive, wanted to um, beat de Kooning. And the way he was going to do it was by making one mark be the whole painting. And he did that by inventing what he called his developer, where he would pull a rake through wet paint and leave one mark filling the whole painting. Um, and he turned this into a method of painting so that he um, invented new ways of optical effects, mm -hmm. some very optical color, mm -hmm. a lot of different things, and he invented then machines that could paint the way he had painted with the rake. Um, so it's like Han Tai, he invented a new method mm -hmm. and then invented um, different ways to use it and different meanings for it. Mm -hmm. um, it's, and the way you talk about Han Tai is a way I've never heard painting talked about quite this way of inventing methods that would have new meanings that could be investigated and inventing new, what would you say, um, methods and tools for painting. I'm borrowing this in part from the philosopher Stanley Cavell, who has oh. written, um, so in 1972, the year that Antai makes this painting, Cavell writes a beautiful book on film and includes
includes a little chapter on wow. modernist painting, which is called Excursus, some modernist painting. Yes. And there he has the idea that, you know, we have to get away from the sort of Greenbergian idea that a uh, medium's essence is defined by an art's literal physical substrate, as it were. So the idea that, you know, the medium of painting is gradually shedding all of its conventions to reveal its timeless essence, which turns out to be the flat, delimited tact of canvas, right? Like, you know, Cavell is among many who think this is actually a pretty disappointing narrative <laughs> about the course of modernist painting, right? And so Cavell is saying, okay, look, the physical bases of an art are obviously pretty important and we would like to see art acknowledge them. But what if we were to take the story of medium development outside this narrative of getting rid of stuff and revealing this timeless essence that is just like the bedrock and we've solved it and we know exactly what a painting is. And what if we imagine that the real challenge for artists who are self-critical in a more interesting uh, and less self-exhausting sense, we could say, was to invent fundamentally new procedures for producing paintings that we could then see sort of have a relationship to the past and not only have a relationship to the past, but can show us things in painting of the past that were always there to be seen, but yeah. we never quite noticed them. Yeah, so it's this idea that inventing a new medium is also in some ways rewriting the history of an art. That when we fundamentally change the procedures that are used to make, for example, a painting, we can have a fundamentally different idea what the past of painting has been about up until now. We've gathered up the past of painting through the lens of the present in some fundamentally different way. And I think this brings us to a point that it's always sort of important to make when we're talking about anti and the folding method, which is that you know methods always have um, always have or imply a much larger view of history. So folding becomes available because of Pollock stripping, but also because of Matisse's scissors, right? Folding is not just sort of indifferently available across all of time and in the absence of particular references, folding becomes available at a certain moment in time as something that Antai now sees could potentially take over the weight and force of painting as a whole, but not with the first one. You have to make a bunch of them, and then you see, oh, I did find a medium. That can only be judged mm -hmm. retrospectively. Oh, I've produced multiple instances. This is something that is flexible enough to generate multiple paintings to repeat with difference, to come back to that idea that we were talking about at the very beginning, the difference between something like mirror technique and a method or a medium that can sustain itself and become this continually renewing enterprise. That's very important. It's, it's always a method, but the method is never simply a mere technique. It's historically coded from the beginning. Yeah, that's very, you're right. And I want to say, I read that essay by Cavell, and I like his writings, and I like his theories about film. I didn't get it. <laughs> I don't have the right kind of philosophic mind or something uh, to under, I, I wish I'd understood when I read it. This was 20 years ago. Um, that he was saying what you now let me know he was saying. <laughs> so um, I look forward to reading it again. And it's interesting that it comes out of looking at film. Yeah. I think one of the mistakes about art in general is dividing it into these categories. Uh, and that painting was given a special position, which I think is better not to think of it that way. That, it, that painting is one medium among many others. In an expanded field, In we could say. In an expanded field, yes. And it's much more, it's better for painting to be thought of that way than as something special and different than the others. In its adjacencies with other yeah. practices. Yeah. yeah. Should we take a few more questions? Yeah. I have a question, and it might be ignorant because I've read none of the literature, <laughs> so I'm coming to this kind of Mm -hmm. um, that are kind of like his folding uh, of his 
So he would have been aware of these. I mean, the one that he referenced specifically in conversation was in fact a Hungarian technique of dyeing that had certain similarities to the techniques that you're invoking, um, which he uh, you know, sort of pulled out his encyclopedia of Hungarian folk art and showed it to me at some point. And it, it, this is a good example of painting in an expanded field that he's yes. looking at these sort of adjacent practices. I think too much can be made of this, and you know, to this day, uh, it is not uncommon to re read characterizations of Antai's pliage that have him like dipping the canvases in vats or something because um, people haven't seen them in person and don't see the brush strokes. It's very important that Antai leaves the brush strokes so incredibly visible, but he is certainly thinking about painting in relationship to this other practice, even as he reasserts the specificity of what he's doing, also by stretching it, right? He always stretches it in the end and brings it back. Again, very traditional format, right? We're always within the traditional rectangular format of painting. It's never the shaped canvas. It's never the free canvas, which interestingly, it will be with most of his heirs, right? In Supor Surface and even Bayam Pete, right? Yes. There it's the free canvas. We get rid of the stretcher. Antai is continually looking at other practices, but he's always saying, it's in the history of painting. And I see that really as the gesture where he says, nope, I'm bringing it back to the history of painting. It's the tradition that I really want us to rethink. That's a particular commitment that he makes. But yes, he's certainly aware of these other practices. And w one more question, and I'm latching actually to this, what you said about the, the, his, uh, the notion of exceeding mm -hmm. the, uh, I know I forgot myself, exceeding the, uh, the intention, the intentionality. Yeah. Doesn't this, in fact, coupled with the whole process of holding, uh, leads him, and in some ways us as well, to think that possibly he is segueing, in fact, to the future, that he is touching upon certain conceptual ideas, or very early conceptual ideas. And I know that we were talking about his roots as far as the old masters. Mm -hmm. But I also think, specifically through this uh, um, inten uh, exceeded intentionality, I see an inkling towards uh, more of a systemic even thinking. But mm -hmm. I might be totally wrong. And since you have met the artist so many times, would you please comment on this? Sure, yeah, no, I mean, he's always, I mean, Antai is somebody who always thinks of painting as a conceptual, enterprise, the important thing on which you would want to insist is that those concepts can't be brought to painting. One is always bringing concepts to painting, but what he really wants is for painting to generate concepts. And so in fact, one of the ways that he talked about pliage was that the great advantage of pliage was that it allowed him to go on without having to continually change ideas because what was happening was that something was surfacing in the work that was unexpected. And then he had to work on that for a while. Sometimes it troubled him, like when he starts getting all of this white space in the paintings around 66, 67, even earlier, as in the painting at the entry, he's trying to fill in those holes, as he put it. He doesn't know what to do with them. He doesn't like the way they're destroying the paintings. And then at a certain point, he has to say, okay, I'm gonna accept that. I'm gonna let that happen. It's gonna move me somewhere I didn't expect to go, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna follow this. And so I think the thing that would still distinguish him from at least certain varieties of conceptual art is the completely generative and decisive role in his work of material contingency, the opacity of materials and processes, and an uncertainty about what even the best laid plans are going to result in, right? I mean, by the time he's working with some of these techniques, like he has a pretty good idea that when you crumple a canvas of a certain size all over to a particular tightness and you paint it with a monochromatic coat of paint, like you can start to sort of predict what that's going to be like. That's the moment that we see him starting to change. He always said, if you know what it's going to look like before you paint it, there's no point doing it, right? Why would you bother? So I think Conceptual, yes, but concepts that are generated through this intense engagement with materials. Thank you both so much for this wonderful talk. Um, I, I had a question about uh, some of the lineage. So you, you both kind of charted out this history of 
engagement with things like automatic drawing, uh, tapping into the unconscious that the surrealists were interested in, and then relationships to action um, in the 50s and 60s. And I was curious how much there may or may not have been a, a direct relationship to chance operations that uh, Hantai was involved with. So I'm, I'm thinking of like artists like John Arp, who's cutting up fabric and then letting it fall and then seeing that as the potential for a painting. Um, and maybe you guys could speak to that. Sure, so he is in fact quite interested in Arp. I mean, when he arrives in, so he arrives in Paris in 48 and then already starting in 48, but then quite intensively in the course of 50, 51, 52, he makes a huge group of works on paper and often these are, you know, pages that have been torn from secondhand books because they were cheaper than good art paper and things like this. And you can just see him working through systematically sort of everything that he's discovering in Paris. It's a period of truly encyclopedic immersion. He's processing in particular, you know, the interwar avant-garde. So he's thinking a lot about everything that came out of Dada, everything that came out of surrealism. Mm. And he's really sort of, you know, just immersing himself in this world, processing all of this. So yes, certainly a familiarity with some of these historical precedents. Um, and then always a question about, you know, what you do with this new sort of knowledge that he's acquired. And I think the reason that surrealism is the, in some ways the context that really sort of sets him on the path that then takes him into Pliage is because, you know, this is a group that coalesced around a pretty clear foundational concept, which is the idea of psychic automatism. An additional point in favor of that concept was that automatism, the stakes of automatism were never strictly formal, right? I mean, automatism is construed as a kind of exercise that one does upon oneself, but also an exercise that might be performed with others, so it opens on all sorts of questions about individual and collective action, you know, ethics, politics, potentially. Um, and then that is, the, that is the concept on which he finds he can sort of labor in ways that are going to take him somewhere new, but definitely working out of a much broader investigation. Uh, Agnes had a question. <laughs> I, I, um, it's so interesting hearing this discussion um, about the historical uh, codex and context and the process and method making and all of that, but bringing it back to that you know, impulse to paint, I sense this incredible spiritual longing in mm -hmm. David's attraction to this optical light, and I'm just wondering if um, you might like to speak to that. I, I feel there's something about that going on. I don't understand it. And I don't want to jump to conclusions that it's a spiritual light. Um, I want to test it and see what it means. Um, yeah, I, I mean, look at this. This is just remarkable that we're sitting here looking at that light and I try to think about where it comes from. I have all kinds of complicated ideas. It's something in our brain through evolution has, that has evolved to have this happen. But do you connect it back to that impulse to paint that might uh, subvert like this conscious intentionality or this intellectual intentionality? <sighs> I think that these things are a part of us, and um, I, I'm very involved in another aspect of an optical effect, which has to do with simultaneous contrast. If you put black and white next to each other, our brain sees it as more of a value difference than there actually is, and this creates light on the lighter side. I, I try to figure where does this come from? Why does our brain do that? And I think it comes from evolution, that it helps us see things in the world that would be dangerous. And um, I think this light might do something else in, in that effect. 
that it's soothing to us, or there's something that tells us something, or it flirts with danger. I don't know exactly. I, I want to find out what it is. For myself, I've had this experience of finding um, that kind of light, either at dawn or dusk, just giving mm -hmm. color. And so it's very connected um, to change and to presence. Yeah, I think that's very. I used to love to paint sunsets for exactly that reason, to see the light as it became dark and as the sun sat, sat on, over the horizon. It's a very much a part of the world and what we're in. Um, but I, I also look for explanations in our brains and the way they've been changed through evolution. That's a hard question, Agnes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but the, the impulse to paint piece is certainly an anti as well. And in fact, you know, we, I selected the little quote that's on the wall in the entry about overcoming the aesthetic privilege of talent, et cetera. But the first part of that quote, which we didn't include, is equally interesting, I think. So it begins, uh, Antai begins by saying, painting exists because I need to paint, but that cannot suffice. There is an interrogation of gesture that imposes itself. The question was, et cetera, and then the quote continues. So there we have both the sort of yearning, the need to paint, but also he's immediately checking that by saying something like, art has to be historically efficacious. It has to be a method of bringing new knowledge into the world. The interrogation of the gesture imposes itself. But that pull is there too. Could you speak about Hantai's relationship to for instance, the metrics in, in trance. This seems to me as though this has a, it's perhaps only an aspect, but it has to do with that idea of materiality. The metrics were tearing apart posters and gluing them back together and making um, what we construed in the United States as process art. Mm -hmm. And um, I sort of look at this and I think of Eva Hesse. Mm -hmm. And could you speak to that relationship? Yeah, he, I mean, he would certainly have been aware of some of those practices. He does, in fact, even have some contacts with Guy Debord, we know. It doesn't really go anywhere, but they have some conversations, they meet. Um, I, I do think that a painting like this, um, so this Marial is part of a sort of C subgroup of the Marials, because he has four that are alphabetically denoted. And the, yeah, and the, the C paintings in particular all have this sort of black, dripping, which is Pollock, but also I think comes out of his manifesto writing activity. And so there is, I think, a certain background here that has to do with the production of texts, and in particular texts that are often um, not just uh, sort of dripped with black paint, but also collaged. Yeah. Yeah, the materiality of the, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's definitely part of this. Paul? Yeah. Oh, sorry. While sitting here, I've been thinking of Stephen Perino, which is really weird, because they, somehow, for me, they are uh, Stephen Perino, first of all, did he know of Simone Tai? And secondly, they're both using a similar method for different means mm -hmm. that they have. I guess, that's a, I have my thoughts on this, but what, is, what are your thoughts related to Stephen Perino and Simone Tai? So Gagosian has shown them together <laughs> in at least one occasion. So uh -huh. I know in, in Paris, uh, before the... Uh, who, who showed them together? Gagosian has shown oh. Perino and Antai oh, yeah. and a kind of larger themed show that was called Folding. I am not sure about sort of historical knowledge. I actually asked Olivier Mosse once whether he might have talked to Perino about Antai and he didn't remember having done so. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that, but yeah, there's certainly a relationship. And I've also never thought of the two of them together, but it, it's an obvious thing to do. It's a so great question. Obviously, listening to you both talking beautifully on Antai's work and talking about how the past has affected him, I was just questioning not the one was that <coughs> he, he sets up a notion of French art. Mm -hmm. coming out of Matisse, but it's written with form, which I didn't really see in American paintings. 
necessarily. And then I think about who, 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 are, who are the artists now or were in the 80s and 90s who were after Simone Weil using this quasi punk attitude mm -hmm. yeah. name yeah. 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 and making these works I didn't as accept. But when I came in here, I saw the white hair and gave me so much confidence in accepting that white. Yes. Not the red, the white. It's a great question. I mean, I love seeing the difference in um, emotional attitude toward painting, that um, there's an anger in um, Perino that I find is wonderful, the way it's, it's cleansing in some way. I don't see any anger in Hantai at all. And um, it's an interesting difference what that does. Um, and no necrophilia, right? Because Perino has this and this whole thing about how he comes to painting is already dead, yes. which is really not Antai's attitude. No, it's not Antai's attitude. Is that right? Yeah. 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 No, but it's because he's a modernist. He's a painting isn't dead yet. And because he is not coming out of art school in the U.S. in the late seventies, <laughs> right? <laughs> And they didn't realize yet that when painting becomes dead, it's like a vampire and it's more alive than ever. Which brings us back into your territory, David. Pardon? <laughs> Which brings us back into your territory. Yes. <laughs> well, that seems a wonderful place to end. Um, we've spoken for about an hour and 15 minutes. We can stay in this space and you know, please feel free to continue the discussion in front of the paintings. Right. Thank you. Thank you.